Hey guys, this is test 66, game 2 from the June 2012 LSAT. This is the shopping center and businesses game. It is an ordering game because we know that we have spaces 1 through 7 arranged in a row, so I've laid them out up here from 1 to 7. Now, I'm going to explain all this, so don't worry about it. These are just the rules in the main diagram. So we have 1 through 7. We have the 7 variables, OP, 2 restaurants, S, T, and V. We know that pharmacy is at one row and one of the restaurants is at the other. So we can either have P on one and a restaurant at seven or a restaurant on one and P on seven. The next rule tells us that the restaurants are separated by at least two other things. So I've got the restaurant loosely ordered by, loosely ordered prior to some mystery variable and another mystery variable and then the second restaurant. So the mystery variables are our two other things in between them, and I've loosely ordered them with the dashes here to tell us that there could be even more things in between them. Now, the next rule tells us that we have to have P next to O or V, so I've got P next to O or P next to V, meaning adjacent. So we could either have PO or OP or PV or VP, and those variables have to touch. We could actually put some kind of line between them just to tell you that you know it could be either order but those are two separate things not both next we've got the next we've got the um, toy store cannot be next to V so T and V cannot touch and then V and T cannot touch so very little upfront work here most of the work we're going to do is over the course of the game itself and this is just our kind of bare bones initial diagram next number six general orientation question. We just want to take one rule at a time and apply that rule to all five choices looking for violations. So let's start by taking the rule that, you know, T and V cannot touch. That's a pretty easy rule to look for right down here. Scanning through the choices, we find that choice A actually violates this having V on five and T on six. That's consecutive, unacceptable. So A is eliminated for, for number six. Scanning through the others, no hits. Let's move on to another rule, like the fact that we have to have P and R, one of them on 1, one of them on 7. So scanning through the choices, we find that choice C has restaurants on both endpoints. That's unacceptable, so C is eliminated. Scanning through the others, no hits. We have R and P on 1 and 7 in each of those. We could next take the rule that you know P has to touch 1 of O or V. So scanning through the choices there, we find that choice D has P on 7 but has S on 6. So P is isolated from both O and V, not touching either one, so D is eliminated. So now we're down to B and E. We can take the rule that the restaurants have to be separated by at least two other things, and we find that choice B has only one variable, T in between them, so B is no good, and E is our answer to number 6. Next, number seven, if S is on two, what could be true? So S on two, I'll put that down right here. Now, S on two actually tells us that we cannot have P on one because if P was on one and it was touching S on two, we would be violating the rule that P and O, P has to touch O or P has to touch V. B would be, P would be isolated away from both O and V. So for that reason, we're going to have R on one and then we're going to have to have P on seven. So R1, S2, P7, pretty good start right there. We know that P has to touch O or V, so for that reason, we can actually infer that we're going to have O or V on 6. That's pretty much as far as we can take it right now in terms of variables we can place. However, there are a few other little inferences we can make. If this is our setup, we know that R cannot be on 3 because then it would be only one variable away from are on one rather than or have only one thing between them I should say between the two R's that would be unacceptable we've got to have at least two variables in between them due to this rule over here so for that reason R cannot be on three we can also infer that we cannot have V on four because if we had V on four then we would have to have T on either three or five and our T and V would be touching which is unacceptable. So a couple little inferences to make here as we run through the choices for number seven regarding what could be true. 
So could we have O on 5? Well, we could have V on 6, O on 5, you know, then T on 3, R on 4. That seems perfectly fine. So A is actually looking pretty good. And that's actually our answer for number 7, of course. I will run through the other choices, though. Could we have P on 1? No, one of our first inferences was that P was going to be on 7, not 1. So for that reason, B is eliminated. C, R on 3. No, we infer that R could not be on 3 because then it would not have at least two things between the two R's. C is gone. D, T on 6. No, if T was on 6 and we had P on 7, that would violate the rule that P has to touch one of O or V. So for that reason, D is gone. We know that O or V has to be on 6. And finally, E, V on 4, unacceptable, because then T and V would be touching on 3, 4, or 4, 5. Either way, not okay. A is our answer to number 7. Next, number 8. I've laid out two different main diagrams here because we're going to make two main possibilities for this question. Now, we could either have, you know, this tells that if V's on 5, what must be true? Not really a super clear starting point. So for that reason, I want to do two different possibilities one where we have P on 1 and then have R on 7, and then another possibility where we have R on 1 and then have P on 7. Both of these diagrams will, of course, have V on 5, and we'll just kind of work from there. So if V's on 5, P's not going to touch V, right? We're going to have to have O touching P. So for that reason, I'm going to have, you know, on the top diagram, O is going to go on 2, and in the bottom diagram, O is going to go on 6. Now, from there, we know that, you know, R cannot touch, you know, R has to be at least two spots away from the other R. In the bottom diagram, that very clearly puts us in the position where we're going to have R on 4, and then S and T will be interchangeable on 2 and 3. So we actually kind of clean up pretty well over there. Now, for the other diagram, we're going to have to have T on 3 so that it is not touching V on either 4 or 6. And so R, the R on 7 forces the other R to be on 4, and then our remaining variable S is going to have to go on 6 because that's the only slot left for it. So we've determined quite a bit here. They're asking us what must be true, and our must will simply be something that occurs in both of these possibilities, not only one of them. So let's run through the choices. O on 2 for choice A. That happens in the top possibility, but not the bottom one. So for that reason, it is only a could, not a must, and A is eliminated for number 8. Next, B, you know, P on 7. That occurs in the bottom, but not the top. And because both of these diagrams are good, they're both relevant, so this is, a, again, a could, not a must. R on 4. That does happen in both. So that's our answer. It happens in the top and the bottom. So C is our answer for number 8. I'll go through the others, though. D, you know, S on 6 occurs in the top only, not the bottom. No good. D has gone. And then E, T on 3 has to occur in the top, could occur in the bottom, but we could also have T on 2 and S on 3. So for that reason, this is, again, only a could, not a must. E is gone leaving C as our answer for number 8. Next, number 9. I'm going to leave both of these big diagrams here just because I want to have them avail available to draw on as I walk through this game. You, know, you don't have to write it down until I actually start doing stuff with it. So anyway, they're saying that if O is next to S. So if O and S are touching, what businesses must be adjacent to that pair on both sides? So like if O and S were 3 and 4, for example, you know what variables would have to be on 2 and 5 as a result? So they are implicitly telling us here that when we have O and S touching, we're going to have to have two specific variables on either side of those guys. So all we've got to do here is make some diagram that works with O and S touching. Then we just got to look for who's on either side of that pairing. So not actually as bad as it might seem as for, at first glance. So they don't really tell us whether P is on 1, R is on 7, or vice versa. It's ultimately not that important. While this game is an ordering game, it's actually not with regard to, like, chronology or with regard to sequence. So what I mean by that is, you know, any valid scenario where we have, you know, a 1 through 7 ordering, like the ones we've drawn in the past, 
any of those could easily be flipped around like in a mirror where whatever was on one is now on seven, whatever was on two is now on six, whatever was on three is now on five. So we don't actually need to draw that many diagrams in general for this game. And we actually have more valid scenarios available to us than we might have previously thought. Anyway, all we got to do right now is draw a valid scenario and see what happens. So I'm going to make a valid scenario where we have, you know, P on 1 and R on 7 just to have something to go with. You don't need to always know everything before you start drawing. Just make some scenario, see if it works. If it does, you're good. So we got P on 1, R on 7. Now we're going to have to have O and S touching. And we know that P and O touching could satisfy this rule over here. So I'm going to put O on 2 and S on 3. Now, in this scenario, when R is on 7, R will also have to be on 4. So let's see what happens as a result of that. Big problem. We've got to have, you know, T and V on 5 and 6 interchangeably. But whichever way they go is bad because T and V cannot touch according to this rule in the bottom left. So this entire diagram ends up being bad. It's invalid, it's irrelevant, we're not going to use it. However, that's not that big a deal. We can still take another course of action here. I'm going to once again do P on 1 and R on 7, but instead of doing O, S on 2 and 3, I'm going to actually put O and S on 6 and 5, putting them at the other end of the diagram since P and O are not going to touch now because O is all the way down on 6, I'm going to put V on 2 instead. Now, I don't want to have T and V touching because that's not allowed. So I'm going to put T on 4 this time and then put R on 3. R could not be on 4, even though that would have it exactly 2 away from the other R because that would lead to T and V touching. Instead, I could put R on 3 and T on 4. And then we'll have three things between 4 and 6 but that's okay because the rule regarding the restaurants is not that we have to have exactly two between them. It's that we have to have at least two between them. So having three between them is okay, and this is a good diagram. It's valid. So which guys did we end up having adjacent to the OS pair? We had T and we had R. So T and R is our answer for number nine. Let's scan through the choices looking for that. We see choice D. So we are good for this question. Next, number 10. If S is on 4, what must be true? So I'm just going to slap down S on 4 right here. They don't give us you know, necessarily a clear starting point, but like I said previously, any valid scenario is automatically flipped. So for that reason, you know, any diagram where we have P on 1 and R on 7, you could, if it works, you could flip that diagram, diagram around it and it will still be valid. Now, if you look at the choices here, they're all regarding adjacency, not regarding specific num numerical placements. So for that reason, I don't need to create two different main diagrams, one with P1 and R7, the other with R1, P7, because either way, the adjacency will still hold true for both of those, so it's unnecessary. It would be more work than is required here. So just arbitrarily, I'm going to pick P on 1 and R on 7, so those are, our, that those are what we're deciding for those two guys. Now, we just got to make some diagram that works and see what happens and hope that only one of the answer choices that occurred in that diagram. So P1, R7, S4. What else can we put down? Well, we know that you know, P's got to touch O or V. So I'm going to put down V on 2 to satisfy that rule. We got to have at least two things between R, the two R's. So R can't be on, the other R can't be on six and five. It's going to have to be on three here. Now it turns out that V actually needed to be on two because, and so does, because if it wasn't, we would have had, you know, T and V touching on five and six. So for that reason, one of those guys had to go down here on two. Now we've got O and T remaining on these slots over here. So we could put down, you know, T slash O and O slash T. If we'd put down O on 2, that would have satisfied the OP rule, but then we would have had T and V touching over here. So for that reason, we, we need to put down one of those guys down on 2. It couldn't have been T 
because then P and T touching would have violated this rule. So this is our diagram for the game, and let's run through the choices seeing what must be the case. So must O and R touch? Well, we've got O on 5 or 6. If O is on 6, it's touching R on 7, but we don't need them to touch. O could be on 5 instead, so A is not a must and is eliminated. Must P and V touch for B? Yes, they must. We have P on 1, V on 2 necessarily, so B is our answer. I'll run through the others, though. R and T touching. T could touch R if T is on 6, but if it's on 5, it will not touch R on 7. So for that reason, C is eliminated. D, S next to T. T on 5 would be touching S on 4, but T could also be on 6. For that reason, D is gone. And then E, S, and V touching. That actually never happens. S is on 4, V is on 2. That is not a must. E is gone, leaving B is our answer if you didn't get the 4. Next, number 11. This is one of those dreaded rule equivalency questions. This is suspending the rules of the game, taking one of the initial rules and replacing it with a bunch of other proposed rules, and they want us to see which of those proposed rules is precisely equivalent to that previously stated rule. So the new answer choice that's correct cannot be more limiting than the original rule, nor can it be less limiting than the original rule. It must be exactly equivalent, meaning we would have no change at all from the previous state of affairs. So here they are asking us specifically about the R, the two restaurants, and at least two things in between them rule. So at least two things must go between our two restaurants. So, of course, if you can scan through the choices and see if anything jumps out at you, you know, maybe you'll get lucky and it'll just automatically click. That's always nice when that happens, right? But you can't necessarily ca you know, ca count on that. So for that reason, one strategy that I like to use for these questions is to look through all the previous valid scenarios that we've drawn, also our initial orientation question if the game contains one as it usually does, because any previous valid scenario can help us to solve this question because any answer choice that renders a previously valid scenario now invalid must necessarily be more limiting than the original rule was and cannot be our answer for that reason. So let's scan through the choices and see if we have any hits. Let's see if anything jumps out at us as being something that might have happened in a previous scenario or a previous question. So I'm scanning through them. A, B, C, D, those all appear to be things that we've seen happening in all of our previous scenarios. But if you get to choice E, O cannot be next to S, we actually do have that happen. For question number nine, the, the question stem itself implicitly told us that it is possible to have O next to S. So choice E saying O cannot be next to S is necessarily bad. We have proof from our diagram from number 9 that O could touch S. Additionally, our diagram for number 10 could have had O on 5 and it had S on 4. So for that reason, E is invalid and we can eliminate it. It is more limiting than our, than our previous valid scenario, so it is more limiting than the previous rule itself that we are looking to replace. Now, a lot of these other choices look like things that, you know, could have been true for previous scenarios. But one of them in particular stands out to me, and that is choice D. No more than two businesses can separate P and R. This stands out because if we have P on 1, we're going to have R on 7, for example, right? P on 1, R on 7. If we had R occurring more than two spaces away from you know, more than two spaces between P and R, meaning if we had R later than four, like if we had o on, R on five or R on six, and then ha already having R on seven, like if we have R on five, for example, we're going to have only one thing between R on five and R on seven, not at least two things between them. Simil similarly, if R was on six instead, we're in especially bad shape because now they're touching. That's especially not complying with our original rule here. So for that reason, D is actually our answer for number 11.
Now, I am going to talk a bit about the other choices, though, just out of necessity. Now, if we went to choice A, for example, R on 3, 4, or 5, that is not as limiting as the previous rule because that will allow us to have, you know, R on 7 and then have R on 5. So that would allow them to, there to be only one space between 5 and 7, not at least two spaces between the two R's. So for that reason, A is not as limiting as the original rule was. Next, let's look at B if R was next to either O or V. So that's telling us, you know, we have R with O slash V or V slash O and then R. So basically imposing some kind of vague block similar to what we have with our POPV thing over here. Now, again, that would not be as limiting because we could have R on 7, for example, and then we could have even R on 6 and then O slash V on 5. That would comply with the new rule, but would not comply with the original rule. So for that reason, B is not limiting enough and is eliminated. Next, let's look at C. Again, C is, you know, not limiting enough. That's the problem here. If we have either T or V between the two restaurants, if that was all they were requiring of us, that's only requiring at least one of two things between them. So we could have R on 7, T on 6, and then another R on 5. That would comply with the original rule, with, with the new rule, but not with the original. So C is not limiting enough and is eliminated. So again, D is our answer. I'll just draw it out so you can see it. You know, no more than two things between P and R. So we could have P on 1. Then we have to have at least two things. I'll just use X for that. R on 4. And then R again on 7. That is complying with the original rule and the new rule. And it's guaranteeing that we comply with both of them precisely. So for that reason, D is our answer to number 11.